Hi everyone, George here. Just before we start the podcast, I just wanted to note that this episode was recorded in mid-December before the latest announcements of further COVID-related restrictions, so do just bear that in mind uh, as the episode proceeds. Anyway, hope you enjoy it. On with the podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Guns on Pegs podcast. My name is George Brown and I'm the editor here at Guns on Pegs. As usual, I'm joined by my boss, Chris Horn, Managing Director of Guns on Pegs. Chris, I'm excited. I knew you would be, George. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's two reasons I'm excited. Um, the first one, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm shooting this weekend for the first time since, uh, since lockdown, so that's very nice. But you know the other reason. We do. It's because of our guest this week. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> We were having a quick chat off air and I've I've told him that our office is a big group of cricketing fans. Uh, so I will intro you to our guest who we're incredibly proud to have on this week. This guest scored over 26,000 runs in first class cricket. His career run total in test matches is the fourth highest by an English player. He's got perhaps the most elegant cover drive in English cricket history as well. He's also a keen shot and he's a patron to the Orson charity that you hear us mention a lot, the Country Food Trust. So welcome, David Gower. Well, very big hello to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, no, pleasure. I mean, it's, 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 it's an interesting mix, isn't it? Interesting mix. And I mean, at a time like this, where all sport has been rather sort of sedentary, <laughs> in other words, we've all been sitting on our backsides waiting for sport to happen. I, I can share George's excitement at being out in the field again soon. Um, I mean, I'm not that excited about listening to myself, to be honest. I mean, that's just one of those things I've, I've, you know, I've heard myself before. This is true. Have you, have you got a couple of days coming up? Um, I've had a couple of days before we've been sort of shut down and locked out and cooped up again. Um, I guess there'll be something coming up probably around, well, sort of after Christmas. Mm. Um, very good friend of mine. I know you know him too. But Bill Tirrett Drake at Bearley. Bill has suggested that January the 1st might be a nice day to go out and wander around that lovely estate at Bealey and I've never had a bad day there so but I've had a bad day in the sense I've shot badly but uh, being there is just an absolute pleasure it's one of the best managers of states you'll ever go to Bill, you know, Bill and Philip are great hosts, so any excuse to get there is good enough for me. Indeed. I, I haven't actually shot there, George. I don't know if you have, but Bill is a fellow director of the Countryside Alliance with me, so mm. uh, I'll, I'll be I'll be doing my best. I'm good friends with mm. Eddie as well, his son. So, um, oh, yeah. yes. No, there's, a, there's a lot of shooting in that family. Yeah, yeah, I played <laughs> cricket with Jack and Eddie, um, and Bill was the president of our cricket club, but I've not yet had an invitation to Bearley. But, David, 1st of January, that's going to be a serious headache day. First drive there. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, who knows, who knows? I mean, it depends what we're allowed to do the night before, which might be nothing. This is true. One of the, one of the things, I mean, I have been to Billy once this season already. Uh, mutual friends took a day there and they had one short. So they did the original signal, which, of course, you know, is that sort of tap on the shoulder with one hand. One short, I filled in, had a lovely day. And we had, <laughs> Bill, had Bill had done the right thing because it was at the start of the various restrictions. Um, you know, it was all It was all allowed, yes, but... The one thing he said is because of their, and this is very, very principled, of course, because of their status in the village and wanting to set a good example to everyone around them, you know, happy to host the day shooting, happy to host the dinner. That was all fine. Dinner was properly spaced out, as it were, two tables instead of one. Uh, so the distancing was in place. But he said, right, you've got to go to bed at 10. You are definitely going to bed at 10. We are not serving you any more alcohol after 10. Off you go. You can take a glass with you. Um, but I thought it was brilliant because most of the time you go to places like that, you know, that pre-shoots dinner ends up with another flagon of vintage port. And by the time you wake up in the morning, you know, the evidence is still there to behold, as it were. It's just a, you know, it can be a slow start to a day. So actually, I felt brilliant the following day. I mean, I'm not saying I've shot me better, um, but at least I didn't have that sort of ibuprofen, paracetamol um, kicked off headache at the start of the day. Indeed. <laughs> well, that seems like a, a very apt moment to ask you, David, what's that you're drinking? Ah, um, well, today <laughs> we will be <laughs> drinking mostly this. Um, it's actually in a beluga vodka glass, but it's gin and tonic. There is a story, which is why I picked it. It is this Gordon Castle gin, Ooh. which is a friendly association. It's, it's no more than that. It's a friendly association, but they very specially... And you won't be able to read it necessarily, but down the side of the bottle, um, when I sort of um, emailed them and said, look, I'm a bit short and a bit thirsty, 
They sent me a couple of bottles. This has um, all my test match hundreds oh, engraved wow. on the side of the bottle. Oh, wow. So this this is one that will not be going to the bottle bank when it's empty. Hey. Mm, yeah. And on the other side, it's got the um, the ODI hundreds as well, which is a slightly shorter list. But all those, whatever it is, 17 hundreds or so um, are there. So if I... If I get distracted, I'll be reading this list. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. They produce that specially for you, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's a lovely gesture because I, I, I met actually, I met the Laird at the um, Countryside Alliance wine dinner a couple, yeah. of, you know, a couple of autumns ago now. And we had a very good night. I mean, it's a very good night anyway. It raises huge sums of money it does. Um, for Countryside Alliance. But and we discussed the fact that he was making this gin. I said, well, yeah, I'm happy to give that a try. And Let's you know, let's try and promote it because there are you've probably noticed there are all sorts of people. Um, you know, gin being sort of the, in the sort of the current craze, or whether it's still going, I guess is a moot point. But people like Michael Vaughan have a gin, Ian Botham has a gin. Um, there are various others promoting you know craft gins and all the rest of it. So I said, Yeah, I'm happy to join the fray. Um, and this is a very elegant bottle. And I suggested we should have a gin off. So we get sort of Botham. <laughs> Vaughan and whoever, you know, try and sort of get in, get into the long room at Lord's, something like that, um, with the various gins, and have a night of it, and see you know, see if we can decide which is indeed the finest cricketer's gin, you know, apart from the gin that's called cricketer's gin, <laughs> which is something oh, really? completely different. You know, oh, there's one out there yeah. somewhere. Yeah, what a fantastic idea! It would be one of those occasions where um, the the next morning you're still you have to ask each other what the actual result was. I guess <laughs> that might also be an early finish. <laughs> <laughs> of the because I mean, especially with Ian around, because Beefy is one of those lessons you learn very early in a professional career if he is a contemporary. He has had a very absorbent system donated to him by the gods above, the wine gods <laughs> and the alcohol gods. And he is, I mean, I, I say to people quite often, there are various days I have completely lost out of the last 60 odd years. Uh, and these are days that followed a ridiculously big night with Beefy. And he seems to just shrug it off. You know, over the years, bless him, he's had this magnificent constitution that has allowed him to eat, drink and be merry and play cricket and shoot and do all sorts, and football, you know, professional football and, and drink vast quantities and apparently shrug it off. I mean, I've, I've seen him after what the sort of nights that would floor um, you know, many a hardened drinker. Uh, <laughs> and yet he seems to be completely impervious to the extent that he was in his Somerset days especially, he was basically sent out the night before a game to take out you know, opposition superstars in Taunton and drink them under a table and render them pretty <laughs> useless the following day, uh, which he did successfully with, with with me and a colleague of mine at Leicester all those years ago before a Sunday league game. So he still had until two o'clock in the afternoon to recover. I was still green at two o'clock as I opened the innings against both them and Garner, uh, which is not a good way to play. Uh, Beefy, when we got to Taunton that day, was sitting in the bath with a massive great cigar on, reading the news of the world, looking as though he hadn't you know, touched a drop for weeks. So that that is, you know, I've learned that lesson way, way, way back. The good old days, hey? <laughs> well, I was going to say, I think it's, you know, we talk, it, people talk about comparing eras and how you can't really do it. And one reason you can't really do it is because a lot of the time... The previous eras were either half cut or hung over, so they instantly get <laughs> well, get extra brownie um, points. I, I, I don't want to admit to that necessarily. <laughs> I mean, we we were allowed to be sociable, um, and there were times I would confess, I guess, under duress, that we might have pushed it beyond the norm. I mean, nowadays it is incredibly professional. Of course, the, one actually one of the big differences, I guess, is that when I mean, talking about Ian, he in a sense was the the catalyst for the nation's press to look upon cricket as something where there was gossip to be had, because up until Ian, um, you know, the cricket writers were friendly, sociable. You could drink with them, not all night necessarily, but you could drink and enjoy their company and nothing would ever be mentioned. And then once um, the Mail on Sunday had got their dossier prepared on Ian and were about to release it to the world, of course, the whole thing changed. And, you know, the game became more, scrutinized off the field as much as on the field uh, and of course we we got through it um there were some interesting stories written some of them might have been true um <laughs> nowadays of course nowadays of course you know there's a story around the corner every second because everyone's got a mobile phone everyone's got social media mm. and you know the modern player 
is under yet more scrutiny. So, I mean, they have to be, they almost have no choice. I mean, they have to, so if they're going to be naughty, they have to do it under very, very strictly controlled circumstances, hidden away from prying eyes. But, um, yeah. you know, it's a very different world now. Yeah, very true. Chris, George, what are you, what are you, well, you go first, George, what are you drinking? Well, I've also got a gin and tonic, second week in a row that I've, right. uh, that I've got the, the same drink as our guest. Um, mine's not quite as exciting. I haven't got any test match hundreds, I'm afraid. In fact, I haven't got any hundreds <laughs> of any description. Um, <laughs> uh, so you're, I, you're just a, a, a slow leg breaker, aren't you? Yes. Slow being the operative word. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's it's my favourite Silver Fox, which is another one of these craft gins I've mentioned before, uh, and it's going down very nicely, very nicely indeed. <laughs> In very the studio. Good. In my studio. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, just just to help everyone who who is listening and not able to see, but George's studio is his bedroom, and he's actually sitting in bed right now. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> excuse. <laughs> so I'm I'm going uh, I'm eking my way up as we go through these episodes uh david i started at rock bottom on some horrendous beer uh and moved up last last week onto a really poor cider i've moved up one more notch this week onto a cider which is actually quite nice it's called old moot cider uh and this is a kiwi and lime version of the cider which is quite interesting but the reason i've chosen this is because when we came up with plan the best days of your life, which is the slogan for the strap line for Guns on Pegs. We think it's just an awesome strap line because it really epitomizes like the days we have out fun, mm. fun in the field shooting with our mates. We came up with plan the best days of your life. We did it with an ad agency called St. Luke's. And I was sitting in the in their boardroom with St. Luke's and these guys just brainstorming all these ideas. And around us were all of the new designs for old moot cider, which had just been crafted and concepted in that room the week before plan the best days of your life so i thought it was tribute to them to drink to <laughs> drink their drink after our strap line came out chris does this imply that while you were there you craftily snuck about three cases of stuff into the back of your car <laughs> uh, for promotional purposes is that it that that would be a better story uh, I can't admit to that being true, <laughs> but that that would be yeah. perfect. I'd it's it's I'd happily drink old moot cider for the rest of my life if I had uh, if I was given it free on trap. You'll notice, David, that he didn't actually say it's not true. He said he can't admit <laughs> to it being true. <laughs> yeah, no, um, George, you must be legally trained to pick up on things like that. Uh, uh, or you're I'm, just I'm, used to Chris's evasive tactics. Well, I'm a journalist, so I guess lawyers and journalists are of a similar similar ilk in that respect. Forensic. But um, yeah, I mean, my sister's Forensic. trained as a lawyer and she thinks I'm an argumentative mm. sod, so probably uh, got the same gene. So I think it's time we moved on. And David, we're going to start putting you to work with our uh, new, this is a new feature for series two of the podcast. It's called Whose Bird Is It Anyway? <laughs> and it's where we've asked our listeners to send in their sort of shooting dilemmas, conundrums. And between us, we're going to work out what the right course of action is or was uh, and help this person out. As always, uh, we're keeping everybody anonymous. So uh, this week, our correspondent is Charlie, in inverted commas, and his email reads thus. Before lockdown, I was invited to shoot with my fiancé's family on their estate for the first time. As luck would have it, I was drawn next to my future father-in-law. Of course, I was on my best behaviour, minding my P's and Q's, being especially selective about which birds I shot and erring on the side of caution when birds flew between him and me thinking that this would score me some brownie points. Unfortunately, my future father-in-law seemed to have different ideas. All day he was shooting, I would even say poaching, birds that were more or less straight over me and even between me and the next gun. Now, I'm not averse to a little light-hearted poaching among friends, but he seemed totally oblivious to what he was doing. Naturally, I refrained from saying anything. But right at the end of the final drive, I decided that enough was enough and I needed to assert some dominance. A lone cock pheasant broke from cover and made a beeline straight for the gentleman. Visible to the entire line, all the hangers on, including my fiance and her mother, every eye was on this pheasant. I waited for the perfect moment, just as my future father-in-law was about to mount his gun and shot the pheasant, the bird folding and dropping a few yards in front of him. If looks could kill, the one he gave me would have had a similar effect to a 36 gram four. <laughs> Is the wedding off 
Was I within my rights to have shot that pheasant, or should I have reined myself in? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. Uh, I love it. I, well, I, I would say, well shot, sir. I mean, most, most of the people I shoot with are, yeah, they're good people. Um, and which is one of the, one of the great things that I love about the the whole sort of the day out and you know I've, I've you know I I don't rate myself necessarily as the world's finest gun by any stretch of the imagination. So I mean if I'd tried that I'd have probably missed and got away with it. Um, I'd have probably let both cartridges go and sort of gone oh, sworn loudly, um, and he'd have killed the bird. So honour would have been with my possible father-in-law if I slipped myself into this situation. But I suspect that the other half a dozen guns in that same line will have seen him do this for the last 40 years. And that they, to a man and a woman, would have gone, well shot that man. <laughs> That's a very good yeah. and he would have, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I And I would say, um, <laughs> yeah, anyway, <laughs> and as, long, as, long as, as long as no one calls the wedding off for any reason, there's probably another sort of twenty years of this to come, which, <laughs> which, which you know, which which will allow this this war to um, escalate beautifully. It's a very good point, and I hadn't thought about that. But that maybe that's why he felt he needed to assert this dominance is because it could go on for the next twenty, thirty years. That's a very good point. That's so true. We don't know how old the father-in-law is, but no, I say most of the, most of the people I shoot with. You know, you tend to walk towards the the first drive and your first peg, and they just say things like, "Well, yeah, just go for it, uh, whatever you see." Um, and actually, you you end up so often getting competitive with those ones that are certainly between you. You're definitely going for those. Um, the ones that they've ignored over their heads, they're fair game. That's always fair game. So if he needs an excuse, if you know the anonymous Charlie or the man we are now calling Charlie. Needs an excuse. It was. I'm so sorry, sir. I thought you weren't looking. You know, I, I could. <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I thought you had your head down, sir. I thought you were just loading. I thought you. Yeah. Were, yeah. Whatever it might be. You know. So, so, but David, you, uh, you have daughter. Do- you've got a. You've got daughters, don't you? Two daughters. Yeah. 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 So, so there is a chance you could find yourself in this position at some point. Um. Well. Um, if you were in the shoes of this guy. Yeah. And this happened to you, and you were oblivious to the fact that you you had been poaching his birds. How do you how do you think you'd feel? Well, if I poached his birds, I'd be very proud. Um, <laughs> um, you know, so I, I, I have to be, I have to be proud with anything that I managed to actually latch onto and kill. Um, I would know. I would be. <laughs> I know, I'd love it. Um, I, it's an unlikely scenario given sort of the family makeup, but the. If that would have happened to me, if I, if I was that senior character, I would like to th- actually I'd, seriously. I'd like to think two things. One is that I wouldn't be quite so uh, Lord of the Mannerist about all those birds that were going over other people's pegs. Uh, and secondly, if someone did that back to me, I'd think, yeah, sure, well done, well done. Yeah, I, I'm and in we, agreement. Yeah, I think he's done the right thing. If we are having dinner that night afterwards, you know, if they were still staying for dinner, I suppose if it was a sort of son-in-law potential son-in-law situation. And there was still a bit of sort of roast beef on the table and a, and a couple of bottles of decent claret or something. I might just tease him saying, well, I'm sorry, but you can't. Have, no, I'm going to drink the nice stuff. You can have this bottle of, you know. Um, <laughs> both both you and know, wine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's Armenian Rioja. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think he's done absolutely the right thing, given, given oh, I think. Yeah. What what yeah. you've pointed out is so true. We haven't thought about the future implications mm. of not addressing mm. this, nipping it in the bud, uh, and 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 just leveling up the field for um, the next twenty fact, years. I'll, I'll be very disappointed if it doesn't make it to the wedding speech. Well, yes, it's not referred yes. to on the wedding day itself. I mean, that would be an opportunity missed. So I think that is a that's probably the most unanimous decision we've had so far, uh, Charlie. <laughs> it is, um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you did the right thing, mate. And because you did the right thing yeah. and because you wrote to tell us about it, that means he gets, Chris? He gets a exclusive pair of Guns on Pegs garters. Now, I have a pair in front of me uh, so I can show David. Uh, but Charlie will have a pair of garters sent to him. Now, you only you can only get these garters, David, if you feature on the podcast. Uh, they are fancy pinked strap garters with a purple navy sort of bluey color 
uh, and an oatmeal tassel. So they're quite Lovely. garish, but they have a story and you can only get them if you've been in this podcast. So Charlie will have a pair sent to him. David, you will have a pair sent to you after Love this it. podcast. Are there socks to match? Uh, do you know what? We'll, we'll get a line. We'll, 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 we'll <laughs> yeah, find some. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a nice, yeah, a garish pink sock. Actually, that'd be quite good. Um, so, uh, yes, if anyone else has any confessions, dilemmas, horrendous stories, or simply just been listening to the podcast in weird and wonderful places, just message us, email pod at gunsonpegs.com. And you could be a lucky owner of a pair of these awesome garters. And then when someone sees you in the field, they will know, having seen a picture of them, that they come with a story. And a father-in-law. <laughs> or not. <laughs> in the case may turn out to be. Or not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, or, may, or maybe just, maybe just a, a very pretty girl who you've had to marry on a very tight budget and leave the country with. You know, it's, it's one of those things. It's, it's, it's an interesting choice. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to find out Charlie's future scenario uh, and in, in a couple of series time, we'll revisit and find out how dear old Charlie's getting on. I think we should angle for the invitation to the wedding, to be honest, as long as it's still on. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll live record a podcast in the corner yeah. at the wedding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, good. Well, look, David, uh, we must ask you some questions. Um mm-hmm. And, and we alluded to it at the start, the Country Food Trust, um, as as many of our listeners will know, uh, I'm a trustee of the charity and we at Guns on Pegs, massive supporters, we do as much as we can. But you are a, well, we are very proud to have you as a patron of the charity. Um, maybe just sort of give us a bit of a, give your thoughts on the Country Food Trust. And I suppose this year as well, being such a tough year and, and, and obviously what the CFT has been able to do. Yeah, well, you, you will know Tim then, Tim Woodward, who's... Um single-handedly got it going and got it going forward very, very quickly. Um, I mean, the number of meals produced now is exceeding all targets. I mean, it started, as you know, it started with a very simple premise that there is a lot of um, fresh meat that comes out of our our sport, um, you know, comes yeah. out of shooting. Uh, obviously, one of the great abiding principles we all have to be very, very keen on is that everything that's shot should be eaten. So, what better than to pick up a lot of the uh, the game birds that are there to be eaten, put them into very accessible pouches. Um, the principle being that you give away one to food banks, that sort of thing, and you sell one. So the ones you sell fund the ones you give away. And everyone gets to eat pheasant and partridge and now venison because the range is now extended to include some venison as well. And I know the standards are very high. Um, when I first joined as patron, the first thing Tim did was send me a couple of these pouches to test out uh, very easy to cook um, incredibly easy to cook all that's been done for you basically you just need to heat them up and so I had two very delicious meals one pheasant one partridge and the, the you know the, the, the I'd say that underlying principle of making sure that um, all these dead birds are eaten and enjoyed and of course you it achieves so many things in one hit one is you know say the food bank thing you're know, giving giving the food away in the first place is a very very good thing to have as a selling point, um, spreading the word about game birds as well, because uh, let's face it, so many people would never necessarily think about shopping for or, or looking for pheasant or partridge to eat um, for a normal sort of Saturday night dinner, whereas we all know it can be delicious. So I think it's it's you know, it's spreading a very good word. Um, I mean, I take my hat off to Tim the way he's done it all and the sort of passion he's put into it all. So that people like me as as patrons, you know, I'm very happy to put messages onto Twitter and to record some videos now and again for him, charting the progress that he's making. Um, and that's the easy part. We've done the odd function. I mean, oh, what, those are the days, weren't they? I mean, yeah. the function, you know. <laughs> yes, other people. You know, you know I'm, just, I'm sorry. You know, for our younger listeners, there was a time when people yeah. used to get together. We weren't just all <laughs> drinking gin and tonic in bed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, people would raise money through it. unbelievably people would raise money so the, all these things I mean, so many plans all the charities I mean, I've been involved with are still involved with you know, are in the same position putting events on hold but doing their best to you know keep the flag flying as it were so Tim's done a great job um, and there are millions of meals out there now mm. or have been for the odd million meals um, produced and dispatched and so, yeah, I, I find it very satisfying. I mean, I know my my long-standing friend, um, you know, Surrey and you know, the Baron of Beef, Baron Botham. Um, Beefy got 
a little bit ambushed at the start of all this on radio because he was he pitched up one day at the Beeb thinking he could spread the good news about all this food being made available. You know, great food packaged up, coming out of the shooting industry, made available to those who basically were struggling to, to buy food. And of course, it, it, it sort of got segued into a, a greater and slightly different discussion about the merits of shooting in the first place. So uh, my longstanding friend and colleague wasn't entirely prepared for that. But under, I say, underneath it all, because that's a very that's a very different discussion. But underneath it all, mm. the project is a really good one. And actually, that that interview, as car crash as it was to listen to, yeah. especially if you shoot and you sort of struggle to understand the angle they were coming from. Yeah. The, yeah. the the BBC gave an apology to the Country Food Trust and gave Tim uh, Woodward a slot on the one show on the Friday evening following, which turned out to be an awesome bit of PR for us. So uh, mm. every every cloud, as they say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, I, I think we're all aware, obviously, that. Um, there are people who are completely anti-shooting as a sport. Mm. Um, and it's always an interesting mm. argument or discussion when you are confronted with it. And I think, I mean, I think we have to, I mean, I, I've always taken the view, well, okay, yes, I shoot, um, not necessarily very well. Therefore, I can sort of claim, I can stand behind the claim that I don't kill a lot. Um, but that's not really the point when you're having that sort of discussion. The, but with people who are implacably opposed, you can gently argue the you know, the countryside elements, you know, the sort of the two billion uh, contribution to the economy, the number of people of all walks of life who are involved in it, um, you know, counter to the image of you know, rich folk having a lot of sort of silly fun, as it were. Um, and I think by the time, if you've had a chance to explain a lot of the benefits of it, um, you might not win the discussion necessarily, but at least people have a chance to quietly, gently accept what you might be saying. Um, and if they are still implacably opposed, well, you have to respect that. It's very true. They, and it's uh, particularly um, with reference to uh, the, the understanding. I think there's a lot of misinformation and stereotyping and this kind of stuff that goes on. And actually, while we were researching this, Chris unearthed an article written by you, I think, David, um, with the headline, Make Townies Take an Exam in Rural Affairs Before They're <laughs> Allowed to Vote says David Gower. Now, that was fun. I mean, you know, you're absolutely well spotted. This was my, now I think, I think, now this is, this is great. This was actually a day I was meant to be promoting at the time, Lathwaite's Wines. And I think this is Reader's Digest, wasn't it? And there's a, a, I think so, a column, yeah. is it, which I had no idea people read. Um, I, thought, <laughs> and, and, you know, I thought it was compulsory for it to get to at least 10 years old. That you're allowed to read it when it was 10 years old in the dentist's waiting room, and that was it. Um, but it's obviously much more popular than that. Because, And I wrote this manifesto, which that was actually a, a bit of a serious point in a, in a sort of offhand way, because actually, it, it, so as you say, it follows on very nicely from the conversation we were just having, where so often when it comes to country issues in general, um, unless you are happy enough and lucky enough to live in a Hampshire village like we are and to know people who are involved, you know, farmers, those that live and work and know the countryside. Well, if you're if you're stuck in Tower Hamlets and have no contact, well, what are you going to understand about country issues? Um, and I'm, I'm not saying that pejoratively. I'm just saying that, you know, we all have our own experiences. We all have our own understandings. And if you have no knowledge of a subject, then maybe it's helpful to learn about it before you do things like vote about it. So you know, any sort of country issue, if it does come to the forefront, well, you know, if, for instance, it's part of a general election campaign, you know, it helps to know something about it, I think, before you make an opinion count. Um, so this, I put this into the manifesto. I forget whether it's on number one or, or wherever it was. Um, but it was quite interesting because on the back of it, uh, and I'll give you a clue. It's article number five in my manifesto was red wine to be available on the national health. <laughs> <laughs> and but with a stipulation that it would be linked, it'd be index linked to your tax affairs. So if you paid an awful lot of tax, you would get a first growth Chateau Lafitte or something like that on the national <laughs> health. If you paid, if you paid absolutely no tax whatsoever, then we're back to Armenian Beaujolais, and that would be sort of left at a distance outside your front door. <laughs> um, so it was, yeah. You know, it was obviously very tongue in cheek. But what what was good actually, what was fun and very good was that the point I made about countryside issues was then picked up. You know, these things, all these things get picked up by the national newspapers, and I made it to page three of the Telegraph, the Times, the Mail, with that point about country issues. 
And I nearly, the, the one show asked me to try and do a, you know, would I do a film on it to them? But they, you know, the schedules didn't agree. It was midsummer and cricket and all the rest of it. So, uh, you know, so that sort of, the urgency got lost on that one. But it was quite good because it did put that into, you know, into a, the front of a newspaper. Mm-hmm. And although there, I, was quite, <laughs> I was also quite amused, there was a, a man from the Countryside Alliance who very po-faced said, well, whereas we largely agree with David on this issue, we might not have put it quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I must I must drop something in. I'm a bit late on it, uh, considering mm. how the chat's moved on. But you talked about events and we said, you know, how ridiculous, you know, how, how much of a thing of the past they were. Mm. The, the Country Food Trust, and tying this all in with the conversation, we, we are doing a, a virtual dinner party uh, in February. So you can, depending on what the rules yeah. are, now let's assume that there's a rule of six. So you can yeah. have, uh, you can have six of you at home um, <clears throat> for a dinner party and then join the virtual uh, dinner party that basically there'll be a, a host and there'll be a sort of uh, a speech and a, a talk from Tim at the start. And then there's going to be a live yeah. auction later on in the evening. So you have a cool dinner yeah. party at home, be as raucous as you like, say whatever you like about anyone, and then join for this sort of auction and, and the speech and feel part of something bigger. And we are we're encouraging people, well, it will be a 50 pound a head charge so it's not a lot of money to the cause but the idea being that thousands of people across the country can take part and i i haven't seen many of these yet i know that they're starting to spring up but i'm particularly i i'm quite encouraged by i think it could be quite i think it'd be quite cool i think there's a lot of people that could take part no it's it's a very good idea i mean it's it's thinking laterally and properly i mean what what i what i've been looking at recently and there's a there's a couple coming up now this this time of year of course all the things that everyone does at this time of year including you know the carol concerts the charity carol concerts and this sort of thing the big dinners um i mean most of these things are having to go online now we did one one of my other charities which i'm very fond of is the david shepherd wildlife foundation after the great artist and what a fabulous family that is because you've got David, who was the most brilliant man when it came to painting animals and steam engines and planes and all the rest of it and championing conservation. And the family, I mean, Mel, one of the daughters, one of the four daughters, ran the foundation for a while. Um, One of her daughters, uh, Georgina, who's known as Peanut, she's now running the foundation um, as she's taken over that role. Emily, there was Mandy, one of the other daughters, who's a brilliant artist, whose work I have on my walls. Emily, one of Melanie's daughters, the other, the elder daughter, is the most fantastic artist. So all those things work so well. But their normal um, autumn fundraiser at the Grosvenor um, had to be done online. So you had Mark Kowardine, who's one of their great supporters, hosting it online. Um, the carol services that are due over the next month or so, I've done a couple of readings and that and sort of bits and pieces that will be put online for various charities. Um, so yeah, all these things like virtual dinner parties, that's a you know, very good idea because quietly, if you can spread that word, um, you know, all those sixes can add up to quite a lot of people. Indeed. I, the idea of sitting all evening on Zoom and stuff like that for these sort of team bonding sessions, I yeah. think I'm a bit, that was a bit sort of lockdown one, wasn't it? Rather than lockdown yeah, but first, two. <laughs> yeah, but Chris, the first one I did was a birthday party for a friend of mine and uh, they'd got to, they did a virtual wine tasting. So I've got a couple of people in uh, and we had some bottles of wine everywhere. And of course, that that went into mayhem very quickly because most <laughs> people have been tasting before we even started. So, I mean, the, by the time we got to about bottle three out of six, I mean, the whole thing was, was carnage. Um, but that went on for quite some hours and some very good people involved. So at the end of the night, we're, we were shouting at each other, low bandwidth, move your bloody machine, low bandwidth. <laughs> Cast the bottle, you know. Uh, so, yeah, the, you, you can't do that every night. <laughs> No, indeed, indeed. But uh, yeah, the idea that you could have a party at home and still take part in something online, I think, intrigued to see how that goes. Yeah. So, David, you talked very uh, briefly about sort of how, you know, not having a background in shooting might mean that you might not fully grasp how it all works and what it's all about. So can you tell us a little bit about your shooting life, how you got started and where you do most of your shooting these days and, and that kind of thing? Um, yeah, I mean the, ooh, I mean I, you know, I was a late starter for sure. I mean I, I envy all those who were taught at the right sort of age, you know, in their teens and brought up on it. Um, and there's a very great, very good friend of mine in the village uh, here in Hampshire who falls into that category, who shoots beautifully. And we have a lot of discussions. The great thing about him is that he shoots better than I do, but I play tennis better than him, so I get my own back on a tennis court. 
um, <laughs> and we have a bit of fun out in the field when we can. But I remember getting taken my first day with a gun in my hand. I had no training whatsoever. Um, this is a bit of a self-indictment, but we got invited up to the, the northeast with some folks, some very good people we'd met actually on the Cresta Run in St. Moritz. Yeah. And we got taken as their guests to Bolton Abbey, which I'm told is rather a good shoot. So, For your first day, that's, uh, that's I mean, setting the bar was, high. <laughs> if I can, yeah, if I can use the word overkill, um, yeah. misguided. I mean, that, it was, and it was a snowy day. It, was, you know, it, was, it would have been fantastic had I been able to shoot. Um, and my lesson in the etiquette came at about two o'clock that morning. <laughs> so, you know, a very good friend of mine is, uh, uh, who's a very good shot, very keen shot, Fellow called Nick de Boinville. Nick said, by the way, has anyone mentioned to you what you should and shouldn't do tomorrow? I said, well, not really. Um, so there was a quick lesson about you know, where to point the gun, you know, preferably towards the bird and preferably towards the sky, and the things definitely not to do, which is like, you know, kill your fellow guns. And I have hit the odd one. I missed a lot, um, enjoyed the day, thought it'd be quite a good idea to go, go and get a lesson. Um, I'd done a few clay days here and there, um, and the, the, you know, the, the, the turning point really was um, a very good man called Des Sturgis. Des, who operates, um, he's had to move now, but Des is a super coach, brilliant coach, and he was operating just down the road from me. So I'd spent a bit of time with Des, uh, understood for the first time there's something called gun mounting that's kind of important, <laughs> um, and things started to get a bit better. So. I mean, over the last whatever it is, it's probably the best part of 15 years now. Um, you know, I've been to some excellent places, some lovely places, shot alongside some very, very good people. You know, it's been a, a very interesting uh, sort of career path, as it were, or learning curve. Because, I mean, I mentioned Bill earlier, Bill Tirrett Drake. Um, they are long-standing friends. I mean, in fact, Bill, I met Bill through cricket and the Hogs and Hampshire and all the rest of it. Um, and eventually he sort of said, well, do you shoot? And I said, well, um, I'm happy to learn. <laughs> that sort of stuff. So... You, know, you have to get out there and and learn. So I don't know. What, what, am I any good? Um, on a good damn okay. You must be um, all right. I mean, I'm, right. I'm, I'm, sure you, although, I'm sure you've been asked many times about hand-eye coordination, but yeah, but my okay, right. Here's my excuse you know, on the record, which is that my tiny brain has been trained for so long to connect directly with a moving object. So a cricket ball or a tennis ball, I'm trained to connect on the spot right there and it, i have to confess it took me a little while to get the hang of you know, lead and mm. um yeah you know, as it were aiming to miss but to hit <laughs> so that you know, that is that is my excuse and on a bad day i find actually what i what i really hate about myself uh, this is quite a long list of things if you get deep into it but what i really hate about myself in this context is when you regress to doing the things you know you shouldn't be doing because you've kind of lost the plot on you know the second drive and it's been too good for you, and you're now, you know, you're doing everything wrong. Um, and in fact, I know, I mean, blessing going back to Bill again, is I've had the odd drive at pylons in, at Bearley, where they tend to swirl and curve, and you're trying not to shoot pylons down and you know, reduce the electricity supply of Eastern Hampshire to zero. <laughs> um, and I've, I've sort of rather let rip with the expletives as, I, as the frustration grows. So I'm, I'm trying to control myself, you know, learn the etiquette, you know, how to behave and accept you will miss a few. And I'm very proud when it goes well. So it's you know good enough to get a lot of enjoyment out of it, good enough um, to be worthy and to shoot in good company. Um, going back to that man, Botham again. <laughs> I mean, Beef, Beefy has done a lot of shooting over the years and is in that position where he happily gets invited to lots of grouse malls. I've done, I think, a total of three three days with grouse. Um, therefore, you know, it's, that's a steep learning curve, as you will know. Um, so I've been sort of trying to pay attention, trying to sort of learn the, learn as we go. But Beefy, bless him. I remember shooting with him um, up in Northumberland. Uh, two days up there, brilliant, brilliant stuff. Um, at St. Allen Heads, which is beautifully run. Um, you know, it's a superb moor. Everything is done properly. You know, the accommodation is brilliant. Um, yeah. Jez, you know, the, the host, Jez is the host, is brilliant. Um, and I, but I had this very competitive long-standing friend, fellow called Ian Botham, uh, alongside me saying, well, how many did you get then? And I go, well, I've got the first two, but I missed the next lot. And he's, well, I've got 20, you know, 20 brace there. And go, Ian, this is my second day on grouse in my life. <laughs> you do 20, you know, 20 days a year because you know all the right people. You know, give me a break. And actually, Liam, his son, came the second day. 
and was next door to me again there and was actually a bit more helpful. So I got a bit of advice. Yeah, I had one of those great loaders who was <laughs> in my ears all the way through those two days. Um, and yeah, it, it got better. But I mean, it, so it got better to the extent that at the end of it, I was thinking, well, actually, I'm starting to get the hang of that a little bit. Um, but there's some very high standards set out there. So I mean, that that was all um, you know, part of the learning curve, part of the banter. I mean, sort of doing anything with both of them involves banter, that is for sure. Um, and he's, as I say, he's very good at what he does there. He's a very, very keen shot, very keen on all these things. Um, but you know, across sort of the south of England, where I do most of my shooting, um, bits of it in Sussex, the Furl for one, which is lovely. Um, mm. Bealey, I've mentioned with Bill, um, various other places. The, I mean, I, one of the great things, you're always meeting good people. Yeah. Um, and if you go back to the same place again, you know, and, it, and they become not just sort of one off. Uh, nice to see you, you know, and you move on. If you go back to the same place again, like the Phil, then you, you're you meeting the same people mm. uh, every year um, and it becomes a a much better event all around. Absolutely. Yeah. So I learned, I learned the other day that we are shooting together in January uh, yeah. at, at uh, oh, yeah. a, a yeah. mutual friend of ours in Gloucestershire. Mm. Um, which uh, so, so we'll be able to put all this back to test then and uh, and hopefully we'll be allowed to have a, a late night before we'll see what the rules are up to then david i, I just wanted to, to pick up on i just wanted to pick on something going back a, a couple of minutes about the um the the similarities and differences between between shooting and batting and obviously you know the footwork and and hand-eye coordination are in there but i hadn't considered that actually you know the the, the mantra in shooting is to take it early and it's absolutely mm-hmm. completely the opposite with batting, where you're encouraged to play the ball late under the eyes and that kind of thing. So I'd never considered that actually being a good batsman might be a hindrance to being a good shot. Well, no, I, I think looking at the ones who get it right, I mean, both of them, as I said, is a very keen shot. People like Alan Lamb are good. Um, Alistair Cook. Sir Alistair mm. loves his shooting. He's a good shot. Um, I've not shot with him, but I've shot with people who shot with him. And they were admirational of his qualities so um theoretically it is just a question of you know something in here something in this tiny brain of mine just needs to be adjusted um it, there is that salient difference i mentioned um and i suppose yeah taking it early of course very very good advice if you took a cricket ball early it wouldn't have left the bowler's hands um, <laughs> and that would be sort of slightly tricky um same sort of range but the it's good days and bad days isn't it and i i, I think the yeah, it is. It is timing, of course. You know, it, there's still that thing where brain to hand, the precise moment you just squeeze that trigger is rather important. And although it's a slightly different sort of technique, as you say, letting the ball come to you, letting the bird come to you, um, whatever it might be. You know, although it's different like that, then with enough hours in the field, then we should all be able to reach a certain standard, um, which is why I've always been quietly and sometimes petulantly self-critical when it comes to these things. And it's the reason, for instance, that I've given up golf, which I think should be spelt differently. It's the same letters, but it should be flog. <laughs> because even though that ball doesn't move unless you hit it, it is an impenetrably hard game to me. And for whatever I, I reason... I agree more. <laughs> yeah, but for whatever reason, there is a missing synapse when it comes to golf that... I took a decision many, many years ago just to let it, you know, it can exist over there somewhere. It can exist <laughs> in a parallel universe to me. Um, because again, people expect you to be good. And most of the people I know, I'm, I have to say to people, I'm the only person I know who doesn't play. So all those same people, all those former colleagues on the field, they're the ones that love a game of golf in between. I mean, both of them again, you know, Beefy is always, and especially as a Sky commentator, you know, Beefy's idea of a good test match was you know, over in three days at a tea time at 10 o'clock in the morning on the 4th. <laughs> you know, his his life you know, in summer, as it were, would revolve around tea times and wherever he could get a decent game of golf. Um, whereas mine was very different. I would say, OK, yes, um, yeah, would like a test match to go the distance. Um, you know, I'll take it three days, four days, five days, whatever it is, but I'm not going to go and play golf the day after. That is for sure. Fair enough. So, so question for you thinking about these yeah. these sorts of scenarios what, what's more raucous a team on tour or a shooting weekend with your best mates well the tour lasts a lot longer i mean the danger the danger of a 
um, a good shooting weekend, of course, is that it's you know, defined by the term weekend, and therefore it's up to you as to how how heavily you go in of a night. I mean, again, yeah. you, know, you have to avoid both at all costs. But the um, yeah, I mean, there is there is that temptation if you're with a group of people just for a, you know, a one night or two that it's a shame not to spend time with them off the field as well. On tour, I mean, I have to say my era, which is what, mid-70s as a test cricketer, sort of late 70s through the 80s into the 90s, was a very good time to be playing because A, we had longer tours, so we had time in the different countries. Nowadays, they can be much more compressed. Um, you had time in amongst all that to relax. Social media didn't exist. There's a natural synergy between cricket and wine. So Australia, for instance, we would meet I mean, one of our great mutual friends, a fellow called Jeff Merrill, who makes the most brilliant wine in South Australia, McLaren Vale and Barossa, um, McLaren Vale being his home. Um, and, you know, you meet all these people. So, you, you know, there was a what I'd call a natural flow. And you can take that any way, <laughs> you know, any way you like. You know, it's a natural flow where it was an era where you could be a little unprofessional, if you want to put it that way, um, yet play a very high standard of cricket, which, again, we would be very keen to do for all the obvious reasons. And so it was quite a nice balance. Um, that balance has obviously changed now. Um, there is a sort of um, mantra where each previous generation likes to say to the next generation, well, we had more fun than you. So a lot yeah. of the people who were, say, touring in the 60s, 70s said, well, actually, we had so much fun because we could do this, that and the other. And again, the pace of life was different in those days. Um, I mean, there's the key, of course, whether you're playing cricket, golf, forget golf, uh, or shooting, you know, is to enjoy the moment. Um, and I think we've we've pra practiced that quite well over the years. Indeed, indeed. Um, so I, I'd love to ask something that I think we, we, mm. we could spend a little bit of time on this, but it's, it's one of those things that actually, if you're at a pub together with a few pints and the, and the rounds <laughs> kept coming, you could discuss this all night. But yeah. uh, that we we our, our last feature of, of a podcast is uh, is what we call desert island shooting. So we traditionally ask uh, basically, what is your ultimate shooting weekend? You know, where would you go? Who would you go with? What would you do? What you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, but we'd like to ask you a slightly different twist on that. That uh, and I'm right. not going to take that. This was actually George's idea. Uh, but um, and the scenario here is we'd like your all time England cricket shooting team. But they don't have to shoot, so right. just assume just assume that they shoot for now. But who would you take on a weekend, and why? So who would be on well, that shooting weekend? Right. We need to, we need to understand okay. the sort of roles and the, and the roles and what they the characters that they play. <laughs> All right. Well, I, yeah. Okay. Luckily, you did warn me about this, uh, and I've broadened it slightly, if I'm if I may, because I've included a couple of opposition players as well. So I've I've taken it from the sort of people I've played with and against over the years um, across the world. We'd allow it. Uh, right. Okay. Thank you. I, I, it's, it's very kind of you. Um, I, I don't want to, I, you know, I don't want to jeopardise those garters. I don't want. To, I don't want those to be withdrawn because I've cheated. You're earning um, them now. <laughs> good. Right. So I'm going to start with a man we've mentioned many a time already, which is Baron Botham of Ravensworth, um, because Beefy loves his shooting. I love watching him compete and you know, be that ultra competitive alpha male. Um, we know the rules. You know, just. If he wants to drink his way through the night, leave him to it. That's absolutely fine. Um, but he'll still be there bright and early in the morning and will shoot very competitively and probably very well indeed. So Beefy, because he's yeah, because he knows his way around a gum, he knows his way around all these shoots, he's definitely up there at the top of the list. Behind him is a friend and colleague of that same era, Alan Joseph Lamb, Lammy, one of England's finest, born in Langeban Vech, who apparently did a, a year or two's national service in South Africa in the Air Force, where his claim to fame was sinking a sort of people carrier type tank thing into a lake somewhere <laughs> near Cape Town. Um, but Lammy, again, of that, of my all, my all my friends and colleagues of that era, Lammy's very good company. He loves the country sports. He shoots, he fishes. Um, you know, he's just a very good man to have around again. So he, and also the good news about this, so this, you know, there's a bit of sort of method in all this madness. They'd be very good company. They would enjoy the day. They'd be very good in the evening. And those two can look after each other. <laughs> so, we don't, you know, that gives, you know, Lammy yeah. can take the responsibility of looking after Beefy. So that's good news. Spot and on. they'd enjoy the day. So that's fine. That's good stuff. Now, of my former colleagues from that same era, I've put in, for a different reason, Phil Edmonds. 
Those of you that remember Phil Edmonds, Philippe Henri Edmonds, Middlesex in England and Cambridge University. Now I've added him straight away because we need some um, some heft, some uh, philosophical heft and clout. We need someone with a brain. And without being rude about the two people I started with. <laughs> 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 they have they have brains, but they're rather different here. Philip Philip is a yeah is a bit of an academic, and a, a, again the the reason I've picked. I mean, there are lots of people who've got degrees from Cambridge who have played international cricket. And yeah, Cambridge, Oxford, but Philip I've included because he's such a good man to have around because he loves an argument. So if you've got a discussion going over dinner, you know Philip will have strong opinions, and he will make them robustly. Which you know once you've got Beefy and Lammy going straight away, I mean that's. Yeah, you know, Philip will just start to wind things up rather nicely. I've no idea whether Philip shoots, but he spent a lot of time in Africa. Um, you know, that heritage of his from Zambia is where he was born, I think. Um, and he's well, done a lot of business in Africa since. So there's a fair chance he might have picked up a gun at some stage, but I've no idea if Philip shoots. And, um, and a, an outspoken chap like that, uh, uh, someone oh. who's, who's got a strong opinion at a sort of pre-shoot meal is, is, is a really crucial ingredient, isn't it? Just to get the oh, thing no. going. I mean, no, he, even, if, even if he didn't come out the following day, I mean, it, it would make for a, a very lively evening um, straight away. So, yeah, so we've, we've, we've started to wind this up a bit. You know, this is this is not just a gentle, you know, a couple of glasses and we'll be in bed in nine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've included, and this is in no particular order necessarily, but that's a good start, Chris Cowdery. Um, yeah. Simply because Chris is my best friend. <clears throat> and uh, when we went to India in 1984-85 on a tour where we had no both of them, no Gooch, no Embry, and we had to pick you know, a squad of 16 to cover test matches, ODIs, no T20s in those days. We needed an all-rounder, and I picked Chris uh, uh, almost single-handedly to be number 16 on that tour party, uh, rang him up and said, you'll never believe this, but we've picked you to go to India. And he said, well, how did that happen? I said, well, if you can't pick your mates, who can you pick? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love so, that. And actually, we, we gave Chris his, when I mean, he played all five test matches, made his debut in Bombay, as it was then, Mumbai now. He got his first wicket in test match cricket by bowling Kapil Dev, having fielded at short leg for a day and a half before he came on. And it was a very famous story because allegedly his father, Sir Colin Lord Cowdery, was in a car in London in the snow, listening to this on the radio. And he drove down a one-way street the wrong way and was apprehended by Plod. <laughs> and they listened to the radio as they you know, heard this news crackling across from from India and plod letting go in the end saying it's lucky you've got a famous son <laughs> <laughs> I, I, did, I didn't I didn't know that uh, that Chris was what was your best mate that's so funny because yeah. he so he's friends with my dad as well, well I'd lived uh, near Tunbridge mm. Wells and obviously mm. Chris mm. lived too far from here mm. uh, and mm. so when he when you kindly came to the world gun makers evening to make a speech that night you must have been yeah. quite surprised yeah. when you saw him there as well <laughs> I don't know well, you... there you go yeah um, just a small uh, small world i had no idea it is. and also the other reason i can pick chris uh, on a shooting weekend is this he's got two springers um i don't think they're particularly trained as, as a gum dog or as gum dogs but they certainly like you know they will certainly chase pheasants i've, I've stayed with chris um many a time where they live on the uh, on sort of the kent sussex borders mm. and when you take the dogs for a walk in the morning they springers being springers they need a, a good long walk if there are any pheasants close by, they're after them. So they're not exactly trained, but they might come in handy now and again. So yeah, so Chris makes it on those grounds alone. Um, then it gets a bit more um, incendiary again, because I've put in, this is really mischievous, I've put in Imran Khan. Ooh. <laughs> yes, because you need the odd prime minister in, yeah, yeah. Boris isn't available. <laughs> um, so we need a prime minister, and of course, with Botham and Lamb, who took Imran to court in oh. the 90s um, to discuss things that Imran had written, uh, which were allegedly rather pejorative and beefy. I mean, I'd never understood how, but Imran somehow won that case, uh, although most of the court proceedings seemed to be going against him. Anyway, I thought that would be an interesting combination. Yes, very interesting. <laughs> to have Botham, lunch. Lamb, Edmund, Imran, I mean, cracky. Um, and in fact, Imi, Imi, I mean, I, I'm hoping by now they've all forgiven him for that and, and vice versa. Um, but he will, have, he will have done some shooting in his time um, in, in Pakistan, in the UK. I'm sure he, he'll have done a bit of shooting in his time. It would be maybe slightly differently organised in Pakistan, but he'll have done it. 
So I thought <laughs> I'd stick him around in there uh, anyway, just for fun. And I'd, it gives me a few more. And again, going back to, so as it were, the good old days, um, I've put in two Aussies. Oh, for a bit of sledging. Dennis, uh, a bit of sledging. <laughs> Dennis Lilly and Jeff Thompson. <laughs> now, the reason for that. Nice. Okay, the reason for that. First of all, Dennis, I mean, they're both good company. Um, they were both, of course, legends on the field through the 70s, early 80s. Dennis has become a, a wine buff. So he'd be quite handy over dinner to discuss the red wines. He collects West Australian reds. So some brilliant reds made down in the Margaret River. <laughs> Uh, and he, yeah, and also things like Grange Hermitage, Penfolds, which mm. you know, one of Australia's yeah. iconic wines. I mean, he's he loves his red wine. So he he and Lammy would discuss that with Beefy, um, and of course all the old times on the field. Um, um, we'd have to give him an aluminium gun to go with his aluminium bat. Of course, that'd be <laughs> interesting. Um, and I've no idea with him. Yeah, but he he's just very good company. Tomo, I have to say, Tomo is such fun to be with. Um, again, this is just for fun at the dinner. This is the antidote to anyone being too serious because I've done dinners with Tomo where he's, and lunches where he's spoken and told tales, and he could go on for weeks. Um, that era of Australian cricket produced some real characters, and Tomo, for an absolute larrikin, tells these stories brilliantly. So he was just such good company. I mean, he's a fisherman. In, in Queensland, he's owned big fishing boats. He'll take people out for a spot of deep-sea fishing. Um, again, I don't know if he shoots, but I don't see why not. Um, I just had to explain to him, yes, that when they're up in the air, please, that'll be fine. <laughs> Otherwise, leave them alone. Um, but they would be very, very good company. Um, so, I mean, this is already quite a raucous dinner party. It's sounding like it's quite it a... It sounds... Yeah. <laughs> and there's, and uh, if we needed eight... Um, the other one I've gone for, actually, is Mike Atherton. Because, again, getting back to the cerebral side, you know, another Cambridge man, obviously. Um, but I'm just so fond of Mike because I think he is... In, in what I still call my game in cricket, he is the best of them at the moment. He is the most clear-thinking, articulate man I know when it comes to talking about cricket. I uh, can talk about it, write about it. I think he's probably got objections to shooting, I would suspect. Um, but again, the antidote to that sort of raucousness over the dinner party. And you know, if Edmonds needs a moment or two off to talk to someone of equal um, brain heft, then he's got Mike there as well. But I just thought, yeah, it'd be nice to have someone like Mike around as well. What a pre-shoot dinner. One hell of a day out, I've got mm. to say. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... I love how you've got the uh, the specific roles in there as well. You've really thought about this. So you've got mm. the important roles, like the sommelier, the guy... You, you always need a yeah. good mate who's going to bring along a decent decent case of claret, just 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 as a sort of... He knows quietly that that's his role, but, he, but it's not yeah. said. So you've done that yeah. very nicely. And then, you, and, then you, and then you've got then you've got the guys in there who are going to you know, cause a bit of a bit of uproar over dinner and you never know where it's yeah. going to quite end up. So I think you just you blended it very nicely. Well, if, if it goes slightly wrong, we might need an ambulance on standby. But, yeah, I, I think we'd be all right. I, I think, you know, the, actually one of the great, again, one of the great similarities and synergies between largely all sports, but, you know, say cricket and shooting, is that whatever whatever heated exchanges there might have been once on a field way back, they tend to get forgotten. Yeah, you just come back together and you remember the good times and you respect one's ability and all the rest of it. So actually, it's quite a good, it's quite a talented group that as well. I mean, you've got two of the world's greatest all-rounders ever, two of the world's finest fast bowlers ever, uh, some decent batting, um, and a very fine slow left-arm spinner. So actually, we, you know, we're actually we're actually building up quite a good cricket team as well. Let alone you know an interesting eight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, I've, I've, I need to put a question out to our listeners at this point because I'm sure they'll be listening to this thinking there must be people that, that, that they should suggest could be mm. replaced. Oh, yeah, that's another good way uh, to get some garters, isn't it? Send us your all-time it, cricket shooting team. Actually, it doesn't really matter yeah. what sport it is, you know, rugby, football, whatever. Mm. Yeah, cool. it really interesting to see. It really start something off there. That's cool. Mm. I like that one. Mm. So, yeah, send, mm. yeah, send so, us your, your shooting team. Spot on. Yeah, I, I look forward to hearing the suggestions. I was thinking that if, you, uh, if you're if you sort of shooting near water or maybe you're on a duck drive or something, surely Freddie Flintoff makes it as a picker-upper in his pedalo. <laughs> I was wondering what sort of dog Freddie's got. Um, <laughs> probably got a St. Bernard or something, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, probably. 
Yeah, that'd be good. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you can extend it far and wide, can't you? You can certainly broaden out the parameters of this one. Indeed. Well, look, so so good of you to join us and uh, and discuss all these various different aspects. We've we've, we've covered a lot of ground, but uh, great fun and, and very kind of you to to share your thoughts. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's been a real treat for me in particular. But in fact, next episode. We've got another exciting guest lined up, haven't we, Chris? We have indeed, George. Uh, we're going back to the beginning. We're going right back to how it all started for our How It Started episode. Uh, and therefore, we're getting on my dad, James, James Horn. Uh, so it's a, it's a bit, of, bit of a look back to, to what brought Guns on Pegs about and you know, how it came about from a need and, and how we got to where we got to and what we're up to. And um, yeah, it should be, should be a really good fun chat. Yeah. So all that remains for me to say is to thank David Gower once again for joining us. Uh, It's been a real joy for me in particular, but I hope everybody else has uh, enjoyed listening to our conversation. Before we go, there's one more final reminder that you can get your hands on a pair of these exclusive Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock garters by sending us your shooting dilemmas, letting us know where you're listening from, what you're doing when you're listening, uh, or indeed by sending us your all-time cricket or rugby or whatever shooting teams uh just drop your uh, suggestions your dilemmas etc to uh pod at gunsonpegs.com and if we uh use what you send us uh a pair of those garters will be in the post for you so uh until we're back with our next episode thanks very much for listening and goodbye well that was very enjoyable lovely (laughs) 